Our Old Testament reading this morning comes to us from Exodus chapter 12. We're going to be reading from verses 7 to 13. And these are the instructions for Passover. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled or water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Do not leave any of it until the morning. If some of it is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I will bring judgment of all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is the day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. This is the word of the Lord. Will you join with me in prayer? Father, thank you for your written word, and we pray it will become a living word in our hearts and lives. Amen. Sometimes for us as 21st century Christians, it's difficult when we read these obscure passages in the Old Testament and wonder what do they have to do with us in our everyday life, which is so complicated and so different from the life that they lived. But this passage describing the exodus uh, from Egypt is fundamental to the whole thrust of the Old Testament. So many times in the rest of the Old Testament, in the history sections, the prophecies, the poetry of the wisdom literature, the Psalms, refer back to this event and to what God did for his people. And this event prefigures what God is doing for his new people uh, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So let's unpack it a little bit. The nation of Israel had been enslaved in Egypt for over 400 years. The time for rescue had come. Moses, as God's representative, had confronted Pharaoh and his magicians. And it was really a confrontation between the true God of Israel and the false pagan gods of Egypt. There ensued uh, nine plagues, each one successively worse. And the demand was that Pharaoh allow his people, first of all, to go out into the desert to worship their true God, and secondly, that they be set free. Uh, Pharaoh uh, prevaricated, refused. Eventually, he said yes, and then he would change his mind and say no. And so we reached the ultimate plague, which is when the angel of death will pass down through the valley of the Nile, and the firstborn of every household will be slain. This is from Pharaoh's household down to the humblest servant, not only of people, but also of animals. And what lies behind it is that Pharaoh has enslaved God's firstborn, which is his own people, the nation of Israel. So God is going to punish Pharaoh and Egypt for doing that. Now, at the same time that this plague is about to fall on the Egyptians, uh, God tells his people that they can escape the angel of death if they pick a lamb that is pure and spotless, one year old, and they bring it into their home, and they consume it in fire, cook it in fire, and consume it all that evening. They are to invite uh, their neighbors and their poor relatives and poor people of Israel to come and to join them in the home that evening. They're not to leave that home, but they are to take some of the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorposts of the house and the lintels of the house, so that when the angel of death passes down the valley, he will see that blood and know those people belong to God and protected by God. And they do that 
with their sandals on, which is countercultural at that point in time, with all of their clothes on, with their uh, garments tucked under their belts so that they're ready to go, packed and ready to go, because rescue from Egypt is imminent and they're to be ready for God. So some things I think we can take as 21st century Christians uh, from the scripture. First of all, we are to offer God our best because God has given us his best. They were to select the pure lamb uh, from the flock without blemish. And God gave us Jesus Christ, the, the purest soul who's ever lived, God's firstborn son, and he offered him on the cross for our sins. Remember uh, John the Baptist introducing Jesus to the world and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He who was sinless died for us who were full of sin. He took our ugliness and dealt with it on the cross. And now when God looks at us, he sees the purity of Christ. So God gave us his best. Why should we not give God our best in the way that we live, in our worship, in our acts of service? Secondly, the Israelites were told to include their poor neighbors and small families who were around them so that they could share the Passover feast together. No one in the nation of Israel was to be excluded. And I think there's a great lesson here in reaching out to our friends and neighbors and to our families, whether they're Christians or not, and inviting them to come and be a part of God's blessing. Uh, anytime we have a Bible study, a church service, a, a church event, uh, even just a time of fellowship in our own home, uh, we should go out of our way to see who is it that we can invite to come and join us. Donna and I enjoyed uh, Thanksgiving and, and, and sometimes Christmas because we would look out for the people who were on their own, perhaps overseas students, uh, perhaps uh, elderly people whose own relatives maybe lived many hundreds of miles away. And we would invite them to come and join us. And we filled up the table with all kinds of people who were very entertaining and all, you know, took part as best they could in the events. And it was always an awful lot of fun. And our children, you know, enjoyed having these other people with them. It became me more meaningful to us to have this, these celebrations by inviting people to join us. So hospitality is a vital lesson we learn from this. And the third thing is to be ready to move with God. They were told to keep your sandals on, keep your clothes tucked under your belt, keep your bag packed, be ready to go, ready to march with God because we're leaving and we're going to a better place. They escaped from Egypt that morning and they were baptized, they said, in the escape through the River Jordan. They came into the Sinai Peninsula where they learned the disciplines and the activities that they needed for worship and the commandments and so forth. And eventually they entered into the Promised Land. But they had to be ready to go. This is the time. And after so many false starts with all those other plagues, uh, they were told, this is it. It's the time to be ready to go. You need to be ready to go when God calls. So I think these three things help us to bring this ancient uh, text back into our modern life. And do remember that today the Passover is the most important festival for Jewish people. And it is the background to our Eucharist and the background to our whole redemption theology. So it may seem a little strange. But do take time to read it and to think about it because it's foundational to who we are as Christians. And the challenge is still there. Give God your best, include your neighbors, and be ready to move with God. Amen.